Boldwood presents The Bride, written by John Nicholl and read by Bethan Rose Young. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 My name is Daisy Earle, just 23 years old, an expectant mother and already a widow, haunted by events, counting the cost, struggling with painful reality day after day. And I'm writing this book primarily for the child inside my womb as my due date fast approaches. I need her to know the truth, my truth, as I've lived it, as it's happening to me. There's been so much mindless speculation since my arrest, so much online abuse, a media frenzy, and so many lies. Some people seem to see me as a monster, fools who've never met me, trolls who don't know the facts. But I'm so very far from that. I'm a victim of events, a survivor innocent of any crime. That's the reality, whatever the haters say. I want to give my unborn child a chance to read this when she's old enough to understand. I want her to know what really happened in my words, if I don't get to tell her myself. Her lovely father disappeared before he ever had the chance to meet her. That's when I learned what grief is. She lost him before her birth. And now she's in danger of losing me, too. Not because of anything I've done, not because of any fault on my part, but due to an imperfect justice system that sometimes gets things wrong. I wouldn't be the first to be wrongly convicted. I'm the only reliable source of information, but will the court believe me? I have no way of knowing. People make mistakes. All I can do is hope. I'm keen to write my story for all the reasons stated, but I'm not devoid of insight. I know the telling won't be easy. Even now, a part of me finds it difficult to accept what's happening to me. My previously happy existence was blown apart, mercilessly destroyed in a way I could never have predicted, and that all seems crazy, even to me. Yes, real life can be stranger than fiction. It can change in the blink of an eye. Everything we know, love, trust and rely on can be turned on its head at a blinding, wrecking ball speed we can't hope to resist, and that's the way it has been for me. Bang! An irresistible tide! Suddenly, I'm the central figure in a tense drama not of my making. A high-stakes game it's impossible for me to control. So much has changed in such a short time as my life continues to spiral out of control, faster and faster, never to be the same again. There are no women's prisons in Wales, and so I find myself remanded and incarcerated in the southwest of England, over a hundred miles from home charged with an alleged murder that was nothing of the kind. I'm sitting alone in my cell with a notepad on the small table in front of me and a plastic biro in hand. Not exactly the most salubrious accommodation for an innocent young woman expecting a baby, but it's where I'm forced to reside. A concrete box, bars on two square windows, a steel door, graffiti scratched into the four stained walls and a bright electric light above my head that highlights every inch of this awful place. I've seen so much suffering in this world within these walls, so much unhappiness, and time passes slowly, oh, so very slowly. Minutes can seem like hours, hours like days. I've been here for six seemingly never-ending weeks already, with another three weeks until my trial. That's quicker than usual, apparently, or so I'm told. I wish I'd started writing sooner now, but if I work hard and put in the hours, I'm sure I can finish in time. It's not like I'm doing anything else. I've given a flavour of my situation and opened a window just wide enough to peep in. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I may have said too much already. I need to start at the beginning if this is going to make any sense. Chapter 2 
I'm a very ordinary woman who had an unremarkable childhood, a girl-next-door type, the kind of person people can trust, not a scheming shrew like some idiots like to think. No one could ever have guessed what was coming down the line, not me nor anyone else. I grew up in a happy home close to an estuary beach in beautiful West Wales, the daughter of a schoolteacher father and a bookkeeper mother, who loved me from my first day of life. I went to the local primary school where my father taught, just a short walk from our modest bungalow on the edge of the village. It was a happy time, yes, happy. I think that's the one word which best sums it up. It wasn't perfect, of course, but then whose life is? My parents had their issues like everybody else. There was sometimes a tension in our home, an atmosphere. Mum and Dad often argued about the same issues, seemingly without resolution. Never about anything major, just silly things, things which mattered to them. I wish you'd stop taking those pills, dear Liz, my dad often shouted. That was a regular theme. They're doing you no good at all. It's time you had another talk with the doctor. I'd throw the damn things down the toilet if it were up to me. I can remember it all so very clearly, and it often comes to mind. Oh, be quiet, Tim, Mum would reply. They've got anxiety, you know that. Why I keep having to tell you, I don't know. I'm just trying to help you, dear Liv, he'd say, almost pleading. I'm concerned, that's all. But she wouldn't listen. She'd shake her head, glaring at him, or storm off full of indignation. It wasn't always easy for me to listen to, but I got used to it. And most of the time, things were wonderful. So I don't want to overstress the negatives. I know Dad worried about Mum, and now that I think about it, he worried about me too. I think that's worth mentioning. It's strange the way the memories flood back as I write. Maybe things weren't always as happy as I thought. I sometimes had nightmares for no apparent reason. Awful dreams that woke me in tears. I remember early one morning, Dad rushing into my bedroom with Mum close behind. Are you okay, Daisy? He asked, wringing his hands, a concerned look on his face. You screamed out loud. You sounded scared. I recall wiping my eyes as my lovely mum sat beside me on the single bed. I had a bad dream, I mumbled as mum hugged me tight. Another one, dad asked. What about this time? I don't think I remembered anything about my dream that morning, or at least not that I can think of now. And anyway, I don't think it's worth focusing on that aspect of my life any more than I have because I was lucky to be loved in a way not all children are, and I was fortunate to enjoy our Aurora Liddell's freedoms as I played with my young friends. I've lost touch with them all now, but we were close then. I feel sorry for children who lived in large cities. I realise there are benefits, but they miss out on so much, growing up too fast. I was blissfully naive, unaware of the dangers lurking in dark shadows. That would come later as fate sank in its fangs. Back then, I felt safe and secure, the bad dreams apart, just as every child should. A fantasy, perhaps, but one I'm glad I lived. I went to the local comprehensive school at eleven, travelling the eight miles by train each morning to the pleasant market town of Carmarthen on the River Towy, or the Avon Towy, as it's written in the lyrical Welsh language. I remember that first morning, the fearful apprehension as Dad drove me the short distance to the station. Everything is going to be fine, Daisy, he kept repeating, full of good intentions, but with only limited positive impact. Is it, Dad? Is it? I said in reply, wanting to believe him, but not quite. Of course it is. There's nothing to worry about. You're a big girl now. You will be fine. His words offered solace, but being the youngest child in the first year of a much bigger school still came as a shock. However, the anxieties of that first day were soon tempered by experience as I settled into my year group, mixing mainly with an old primary school friend initially, but soon making new ones. 
Sadly, those friendships didn't last into adulthood either, something I've had to accept. People move on, things change, and I guess it's no great loss. Such is life. I began enjoying my lessons, particularly English, history and art, as the weeks passed. My marks were good, better than expected, and close to the best in my class. I remember the beaming smile on my dad's face when he read my first end-of-term report. It seemed he could hardly contain his excitement as he informed my mum of my newfound success, his musical, sing-song voice rising in pitch and tone. He was expressive, brimming with emotion. I hadn't seen him like that before, never once. He seemed to come to life. His eyes lit up, he glowed, as if, at that moment, all of life's burdens had melted away. She's done wonderfully well, Derleth. A chip off the old block, if ever there was one. My dad laughed at full volume and then continued talking, now in full flow, communicating with repeated hand gestures as well as words. He pointed at the report on my laptop screen. Look at those marks. Brilliant. An average of over 80%. She's almost as intelligent as a father. Not quite, of course, but not far off. Maybe she'll be a teacher too. Thanks, Dad, I said, and I meant it. I was grateful. The praise felt good. I wasn't the most confident child in the world, and even now, when I think back to that day, it fills me with pride. It bubbles up, filling my chest. My dad's opinion mattered to me as a child, and it seems it still does. That's one thing that hasn't changed when so much else has. I'll try to give my child that same encouragement, if I ever get the chance. James Robin Earle entered my life when I was just fifteen, a few weeks before my sixteenth birthday. He was about a year older than me. I later learnt he'd moved to our quiet Welsh coastal village from the Greenwich area of London with his parents, after his father was given the opportunity to work from home as a successful architect. They moved from their small end-of-terrace property close to the Thames to a large, detached, mock Tudor house fronted by impressive gardens with a glorious sea view. It seemed like a good deal to me. James appeared shy when I first saw him at the local village youth club, slightly diffident, much like me. But I found an intelligence about him and a quiet strength, too. I later discovered he was a lover of books, again like me, not the typical teenager, and our friendship largely stemmed from that. I particularly enjoyed Agatha Christie back then, despite my youth, and I still do. The extremes of human behaviour have always fascinated me. In my current circumstances, the irony isn't lost on me. James and I said nothing to each other on that first evening at the youth club. As I recall, he sat at the edge of the room, saying very little to anyone. He'd entered a new world, an alien society in rural Wales with a different history, culture and customs. No wonder he was silent. But we talked when I next saw him, this time seated cross-legged and alone on a grassy knoll close to the sea one warm May evening. He glanced in my direction, raised a hand, and waved as I strolled past with our family dog, and then he said hello in his English accent. Hi, Daisy, isn't it? He called out with a grin. I found myself pleased to see him. I turned towards him, nodding with a smile, rather than hurrying on by, as I likely would have had one of the local Welsh lads approached me. One or two tried their luck, but I was never receptive to their clumsy advances. With James, it was different. There was a mutual attraction right from the start. What's your dog's name? He asked. His second question. I could tell he was keen to talk, and I was happy to reciprocate. Holly, she's a retriever. He picked up a small stick washed up by the tide and threw it, studying me the whole time, never looking away, have you done something different with your hair? He asked. Question number three. And so unusual for a boy of his age. I looked away, averting my gaze to the sand, shifting my weight from one foot to another. 
It's the wash and cut, that's all. Another smile lit up his boyish face as I raised my eyes. He looks great, really suits you. I felt myself redden. I must have blushed crimson. I pointed to a well-thumbed paperback on the ground next to him, keen to change the subject, but flattered. What do you read in? He picked the book up, stroking the dog with his free hand and pushing the animal away when she licked his face. It's, uh, it's a thriller, recommended by my mum. Any good? Yeah, it's great. You can borrow it when I finish if you like. I nodded again, not wanting our exchange to end. Okay, thanks, I will. James flashed another smile. I hope you don't mind me asking. Do you fancy going out sometime, just you and me? It wasn't something I had to think about. In my head, I was already shouting, Yes! I couldn't get my words out fast enough. Yes, yes I would. And that was it. We arranged a first date. It all started with that conversation. James was an individual who didn't follow the crowd. I liked that about him. He stood out. I stopped to talk because I liked him. Instinctively, it felt right. That came as a surprise. It wasn't something I'd experienced before. I was comfortable in his presence. It was almost as if I'd known him all my life. As if our meeting was written in the stars. I'm not over-romanticising the past. I realise some may think that, but it's really how it was. I can't say I loved him from that moment, but there was a connection. I knew our meeting was significant right from that day. I later told my mum that I'd won the relationship lottery. I felt so lucky, so fortunate to be that girl. If only it had lasted longer than it did. I can picture James back then as if it were yesterday. The years melt away as I cast my mind back, pictures playing behind my eyes as if in real time. Large, bright and bold. I can see his lightly tanned, freckled, sixteen-year-old face topped with a tangle of shining jet-black curls, his bright blue eyes, his slightly uneven white teeth, and his long, slim body, dressed in faded jeans, a loose white cotton t-shirt and open-toe sandals, the type popular with surfers. Thinking about him, it's almost as if I can reach out to touch him, take his hand in mine and feel the warmth of the blood flowing in his veins. Almost, but not quite. He's always just out of my reach. I can never quite grasp him, however hard I try. If I call his name, there's no one to answer. If I search, there is no one to find. James pet my cheek before we separated that evening, something I'll never forget. It was as if my heart had missed a beat. I felt an energy surging through my body, a spark, an electric current like I'd never experienced before. It was one of those magical moments that stand out in life, a high point. We already had a bond that I believe we both recognised and appreciated. It was meant to be. I looked back and waved when I finally stood to walk away about twenty minutes later. I'd never felt so self-aware. I was desperate for him to like me as much as I liked him. And I believed he did. I really did. Everything had changed. My world seemed a different, better place. I didn't want to leave him. I could have stayed there forever. A tad overdramatic, but true. We went to the cinema the following Friday evening, travelling to Carmarthen by train and then walking hand in hand from the station. We sat near the back, ate sweet popcorn and kissed, sensual, lingering, for the first wonderful time. It was all about our connection. The film didn't matter. I can't even recall the title. It was a mindless comedy I don't think either of us particularly enjoyed. We had that in common too. I wrote all about it in my diary when I got home. Not about the film, about him. The kisses, how his erotic touch made me feel. Two pages of joyful, happy writing decorated with small hearts coloured with a red felt-tip pen. 
I pictured James touching me, fantasizing as they put out the light, too excited for sleep. There were no bad dreams that night. It was as if my entire existence had finally found meaning. The most romantic, delightful development. I cry when I read those pages. That's how our love began. Chapter 3 I've been looking forward to this, James said with a grin as we sat together at a secluded riverside spot, well away from potentially prying eyes on a sunny September afternoon. I was sixteen and he was seventeen, and we were in love. I remember our first time so very well. I nodded once as James squeezed my hand, looking into my eyes. I was a virgin. What we were about to do was a big deal for me. Hormones were surging through my teenage system. There were still nerves. Have you got the condoms? I whispered after James kissed me insistently for a second time, unzipping his trousers. And that was all it took. No more words. I like to think James was gentle, patient and caring, as well as passionate. Within a short time, two became one. We were lovers as well as friends. I'm so very glad I can hold on to that memory. It's a place I often visit in my mind's eye, because memories are the one thing I have left of him. I sometimes think nothing matters more. My parents were initially less enthusiastic about our growing commitment, but that all changed as they got to know him better. I recall my dad smiling shortly after James left the bungalow one dark autumn evening. You've got a good one there, Dad said in his sing-song voice. He's a bright lad, and he's not frightened to express an opinion. I like that. Quite impressive for someone so young. You like him, Dad? Do you really like him? He laughed. I said so, didn't I? Mum didn't say anything in support, but I'm sure she was thinking along the same lines. Because James's intelligence shone out, he knew so much about so many things, and I was glad my parents approved. I saw it as another milestone, one less thing for them to argue about, another hurdle overcome on my way to long-term happiness. James entered the sixth form a year before me, and I wasn't in the least bit surprised when he achieved three A stars at A-level two years later. I'll be studying history at Swansea, he told me an announcement rather than a discussion. We talked about our future studies and shared a love of learning, but the reality of his going still felt a shock. Berryside to Swansea is only about forty minutes by train and a little longer by car, so I told myself things could be a lot worse. I tried to look pleased as we sat talking, but my true feelings were written all over my face. What's up, Daisy? he asked. Come on, I know there's something. No, it's great. I'm delighted for you, I said. It's the course you wanted at the university you wanted. What's not to like? James reached out, touched my face, and wiped away a tear. What are you really thinking? He asked. Come on, you know you can tell me anything. You're not crying for no reason at all. And then it poured out of me, an emotional torrent, everything I'd been thinking, all the things I dared not say. What if you meet someone else, a more intelligent girl perhaps, or someone prettier, someone who grew up in a big city like you? That's not going to happen, a quick reply. I wanted to believe him, but with me there were always doubts. I know you're attractive to other girls, I said. I've seen him look in. He looked away, I think suppressing laughter, but I can't be sure. Oh, come off it, Daisy, he said. You're being ridiculous. It's you I love. I could have gone anywhere. I've got the grades, but I chose Swansea because of you. Why on earth did I let my anxieties get the better of me? James did love me. He spoke the truth. I would lose him, but not yet. He was as committed to me as I was to him. Even after leaving for Swansea, he was so very caring, 
ringing or texting me often, sometimes ten or even fifteen times in one evening, on the rare occasions I went out. Where are you, Daisy? What are you doing? Who are you with? What time are you going home? He repeatedly asked the same four questions, I think needing reassurance I was safe and well. That's the sense I make of it. Yes, I was truly loved for as long as our relationship lasted. Later on, I saw a lot in my role as a nurse. Some might say too much. Not everyone is nearly so lucky. Some never experience love, let alone true love, at all. James usually came home every two or three weeks during term time, and I occasionally made the journey on those weekends he didn't get back. Although, of course, he sometimes had to prioritise his studies. I've got too much work on, Daisy, he'd say as I cried and pleaded. You can come next week, or perhaps the week after. Stay in with your mum and dad. Concentrate on your revision, and I'll let you know once I'm free. You've got no idea of the pressure I'm under. It's a really full-on course. I didn't see as much of James as I'd have liked, but I understood. He explained it often enough and his first year of higher education passed surprisingly quickly despite my angst. I applied for a place at the same university to study nursing, and I worked even harder now, ensuring I gained the results I needed. Two A's and a B. It wasn't so much the course that attracted me, although I was interested in nursing. My primary motivation was being with James. Work matters. Careers, success and all the trappings that go with them are all very well, but they're not life, not what really matters when we look back to evaluate our lives. Experience has taught me that. Life's trappings can all seem so very important until a real crisis hits. Bang! And then, in an instant, they don't matter at all. I realised that even at eighteen, although I couldn't have put it into words back then. Not as I have now. That's glaringly obvious from reading my diary. The comments are simplistic, clumsy even, but the foundations are there. I talked of the course briefly, with no particular passion I can identify, but so much more of my scribbled, girlish writing was directed towards James, almost to the point of obsession. I feel sure that the depth of my love made the future loss I didn't see coming all the harder to bear. That seems obvious. How else could it be? We rented a small flat in the uplands area of the sprawling Welsh seaside city two weeks before my first term began. James had worked at a local bar during the evenings to create a deposit, and I contributed a small amount from my savings. The flat was basic, a little faded, badly in need of decoration, and expensive for what it offered, but we were together and for all the flat's many faults, that was good enough for me. There were still anxieties, but life felt exhilarating as a new chapter dawned. I couldn't wait to get on with it. Maybe I shouldn't have been in such a rush. Even if the flat wasn't beautiful, I liked to think our relationship was. We made love that evening for the first time in our new home. We had sex often, three, maybe four times a week and sometimes more than that. What can I say? Oh God, you turn me on, Daisy. I'm coming, I'm coming, don't stop, please don't stop. I can recall the electric touch of his hand, the heat, the heady emotion as he embraced me, fully erect, rhythmically moving his lean body with gradually increasing speed until I reached a climax with a throaty groan. I always came, every time. There was so much love in him. If I close my eyes, it's almost as if I'm there, as if I can reach back in time. There's a pleasure in remembering, picturing the scene, the sweet sorrow. I wouldn't ever want to forget what we had together, but sometimes the memories in my current single state are almost too much to bear. They hurt, they sting as well as please. We were so close, the two of us, and we rarely argued, not in a heated way as my parents had. James and I sometimes disagreed, of course we did, what couple doesn't? 
it wasn't all lovemaking. And it seemed we always disagreed about the same things, repeated themes. When we disagreed, I sometimes thought it was because he loved me almost too much. You need to stay in to concentrate on your studies, he'd insist if I wanted to go out. But you socialise, you always go out, I'd reply. I never meet any of your friends, and I haven't got friends of my own. If I ever go out, it's always with you. He'd look hurt rather than angry. What's wrong with me? Nothing, I didn't say that, nothing. Well, what are you worrying about then? Why the fuss? Why the big deal? Can I come with you tonight? Ugh, he'd sigh, make a face. It's a lad's night, no girls allowed. We'll go for a curry on Friday, to that place you like. You'll have your essay finished by then. That was usually the end of it, as far as our discussions went. And then he'd go, closing the flat door, leaving me alone. I'd feel guilty for saying anything at all. James was brighter than me. He didn't need to work so hard. Why was I so needy? I should have understood. I found lipstick on his shirt collar once when he arrived home late. I remember staring at it, pointing and asking, What's that? While resisting the impulse to vomit. But he laughed it off. It's nothing. Oh, one of the lads was messing about. He's an idiot. He had his girlfriend's lipstick with him. His idea of a joke. He thought he'd wind you up. It unnerved me at first, feeding my insecurities. But in the end, I believed him. James could usually convince me of his point of view, and disagreements never became personal. There were no verbal attacks. That was important to me. I liked to think we were happy most of the time. Those few disagreements apart. If only it could have stayed that way. Such things are fragile, so easily lost. James finished his course a year before me, easily achieving his degree. He'd decided to become a teacher like my dad, although James chose secondary education, something to which I thought him entirely suited. He had an easy confidence by then, so unlike me, and he was a good communicator. Words came easily to him, and he loved his subject too. He used to say that if we didn't understand history's lessons, we were doomed to repeat past mistakes. I didn't give his wise words much thought then, but I now realise it's true. I'm a lot more careful now, not so ready to trust. A hard lesson learned, the hardest of my life. We stayed in Swansea for another year after that, living in that same rental flat, enabling me to complete my nursing course, while James travelled to Carmarthen by train each weekday, studying for a PGCE in secondary history at the town's Trinity College. He said he was sure he'd made the right choice, that teaching was definitely for him. All was good, and things continued to go well for us. We didn't see the storm clouds coming our way. Within a year, we were both qualified and ready to join our chosen professions, having built up a heavy burden of student debt. There was a shortage of qualified nurses, so I obtained a post at Llanelli Hospital relatively quickly. I applied online, provided references and was shortlisted. Two pleasant female managers interviewed me a week or two later and offered me the job that same day. It was another milestone, another change, but a welcome one. The future was calling. I was a grown-up, ready to embrace the adult world, and the money would be very welcome. There was that too. I remember giving James the good news. It was me doing well for a change, and it felt good. But where are we going to live? He asked, as if he wasn't pleased at all. I'd really like to go back to Fairyside, I said, somewhere close to the beach, ideally with a view, although anything there would do. What about the travelling? I took a deep breath. Dad's offered to lend me enough for a car. I know fuel costs will be high, but it's doable. 
and I can transfer to Carmarthen once there's a suitable vacancy. Are you sure? I'd never been more sure. It's what I want, James. We were happy there, and it will be good to be near our parents. What does a bit of inconvenience matter? There were a couple of seconds of silence. Okay, let's do it. And that was it. I could have cheered, and maybe I did. I bought a shiny black Nissan Primera a few days later. Our quality of life seemed more important than money, although it didn't always feel that way when the inevitable bills arrived. James and I moved into a 300-year-old stone-built rental cottage owned by close friends of my parents about two weeks after I got my job. It was ideally located on the quiet Bee Road from Ferryside to Kidwelly, with a lovely lawned front garden bordered by flower beds and an excellent view of the estuary from the two first-floor bedrooms at the front of the building. For me, it was a dream come true. I'd always loved that cottage. It's picture-perfect, with pink roses around the front door. I fantasised about living there when I walked past it as a child. And now it was mine, albeit on a rental basis. We both hoped to buy our own home at some future date, and I really wanted it to be the cottage. But we weren't financially able to achieve that, even if the owners were willing to sell. I prayed that one day I'd find a way. James didn't find work as easily as I had. He applied for jobs in local schools when a rare vacancy arose, but sadly without success. He was called for several interviews, but no more than that. In all honesty, he could be opinionated, forthright, and a little obstinate when the mood took him. I wondered if that could be a factor, but of course I never mentioned it. And in the end, after about four months of unemployment, James accepted temporary defeat. He started working at a council-run leisure centre near Carmarthen, where he trained in first aid and qualified as a lifeguard, amongst other things. He didn't dislike the job fundamentally. He was a fit man and a strong swimmer, but it wasn't what he'd studied for four years to achieve. At least it pays the bills, Daisy, he'd sometimes say. But there was an unmistakable sadness about him whenever he left for work. He tried to hide it, but it was always there. He never gave up on the idea of becoming a teacher, but sadly it never happened for him. That still brings a tear to my eye. It does now as I write these words. I was content living with James as a partner, but marriage seemed the logical next step. I'm not sure why it mattered to me, but it did. I'd been hinting at marriage for months, less than subtly, pointing at rings in local jewellers' windows talking about other couples we knew who'd made it official, all older than us. James couldn't help but get the message, and I knew he was planning something. He wasn't good at keeping secrets, or at least that's what I thought. When I found a receipt from a local goldsmith's in a trouser pocket when doing the washing, I knew it was happening, just a matter of time. James proposed the following Sunday at lunchtime, down on one knee in our cottage kitchen, looking up at me with a boyish grin, about a year or so after we returned to Ferryside. How about we make it official? He asked with a grin. Of course I want to marry you, I said giggling. Yes, yes, yes. He took a ring from his pocket, a single solitaire diamond in a platinum mount on a yellow 18 carat gold band. Oh my God, it's beautiful, I said. And look at that, it fits perfectly. He kissed me. Glad you like it. I was proud to wear it on my finger, glad to have something that proved James was mine. And he wore a ring too, not to show ownership, but mutual commitment. It felt as good as I'd imagined so many times that it would. We celebrated our engagement that evening with red wine and sex, and I made a special effort to mark the occasion. Expensive French perfume, black mascara, smoky eyeshadow, bright red lipstick, shaved legs and bikini line, 
even a matching push-up bra and lacy red thong with an enticing satin bow at the back. Oh, and stockings. I wore a lace suspender belt and glossy black stockings, I think the first time I ever had, and it all got the reaction I'd hoped for. I created a male fantasy for James because I loved him. I could see his eyes light up as I unfastened my bra, dropping it to the lounge floor, swaying rhythmically on my four-inch heels as a soulful music compilation played in the background. I stripped slowly, and what I liked to think was gracefully, in the light of scented candles as James focused on me, aroused and lustful. His reaction made me feel sexy, attractive and desired. I'd never seen James more turned on, making for a memorable night as we enjoyed each other's bodies. I do like sex, and I'm happy to acknowledge that. And with James, it was a joy. But I won't share any further details of our lovemaking, because they're mine. That's as much as I'm going to say. Readers can use their imaginations if they choose to. That's something I can't control. Chapter 4 James and I were married the following January on the second of the month at the small, picturesque church in Llandarog, a 19th century stone structure dedicated to St. Turog, a Celtic saint. Both my parents grew up in the quiet rural village, only about 13 miles from Ferryside, where they spent most of their adult lives after Dad got his job at the local school. So the location of the wedding wasn't James's or my choice, but we were happy to go along with the arrangements. It seems there was an assumption on my parents' part that that's where we'd get married, as they had many years before, and so we did. It's a beautiful church with impressive stained-glass windows in a pretty Welsh village surrounded by rolling green hills even in winter, and so I had no objections. Sometimes it's best to go with the flow. Life's easier that way and less contentious and it pleased my parents, which in turn pleased me. They'd always put me first as a child. This time, I did the same for them. Our wedding day went reasonably well in the main, or so I thought at the time. It was a cold, wet winter day, not exactly ideal for a marriage ceremony, but it was January, and several of my nursing colleagues were there, friends of my parents and my relatives, two first cousins, one with a three-year-old son and my auntie and uncle. So the climate hardly mattered, not as much as you'd think. One thing that disappointed me was that very few people came on James's side, just his parents and a few male friends from his university days. I thought it strange, but it seemed it wasn't something he wanted to discuss at any length. He simply reminded me he had a small family and left it at that. I guess I trusted him, taking his word at face value because I loved him as much as I did. I'm a little older now, more world-weary. I see red flags where I didn't before. My love hasn't changed, but my perception has. When my dad led me up the aisle, I felt beautiful, dressed in a stunning white lace dress with a veil to the sound of rousing organ music, to where James was standing waiting together with the vicar near the altar wearing a new navy Italian suit, shiny black leather shoes, and a dark red silk tie with a Windsor knot. The vicar performed the ceremony with practiced ease, and within a short time we had made our vows. James had kissed me gently on the cheek, and we were pronounced man and wife. One person turned up at the church who I was surprised but pleased to see. Oliver had spoken to me a few times on campus and was always friendly. He'd even bought me a coffee once in the student union, something I'd never told anyone until now. I knew James knew Oliver too, but I couldn't recall seeing his name in the invites. He was a tall, slim young man with shoulder-length brown hair parted in the middle, and a slight limp, as if he'd injured himself or one leg was slightly shorter than the other. But none of that detracted from his attractiveness. He was a good-looking lad with a relaxed demeanour who was easily liked. 
Oliver approached me with a warm smile outside the church to congratulate me on my marriage as I made my way back to the waiting wedding car with a sizable white golf umbrella held high above my head. I'd heard his voice before, of course, but I still couldn't place his accent. English, London maybe, certainly not Welsh. It wasn't unlike James's, but I thought not quite the same. He was still standing there in the cold and rain, waving, getting gradually wetter, as the car drove away with James and me seated in the back. James appeared to ignore him completely, which I put down to his focus on me. I knew I hadn't invited Oliver to the ceremony, but I assumed James must have, despite not saying anything to me. It was a supposition, no more than that. I didn't give it much thought, and I didn't ask. But our wedding was announced in the local paper, something else my parents arranged. Just written words, no photos, and I'd mentioned the ceremony on social media more than once, something James never did. He had no accounts. So, looking back, Oliver may have found out in one of those ways and decided to come. He didn't attend the reception. If he had, there wouldn't have been a seat for him at any of the tables. It might have caused an awkward scene. Oliver must have realised that because he wasn't a stupid man. I don't think I gave it much thought, not really. Not on that day, if any at all. That came later. It seemed less important back then as Oliver sat alone at the back of the church, watching as James and I made our vows and exchanged our gold rings. The wedding reception was held at Ferryside's Three Rivers Hotel by the sea, surrounded by beautiful, unspoilt countryside, with stunning views of ancient San Stefan Castle across the water on the other side of the estuary. We enjoyed tasty local food with our guests, fresh salmon, greens and potatoes, listened to speeches, and then danced late into the night as the alcohol continued to flow from the well-stocked bar. It was all memorable and enjoyable, living up to my expectations in every way. The venue arranged by my parents did us proud, and I'm grateful for that. Another milestone was reached. I hoped one of many as we grew together, James and I. And I was pregnant. Now that does bring a smile to my face. I hadn't told James yet. I hadn't told anyone. I'd only just found out myself. I knew I was late and had been feeling a bit queasy, so I did the test on the morning of the ceremony before putting on my dress. I remember my nervous anticipation of awaiting the result and excitement about seeing the two blue lines appear in the small plastic window, confirming my expectations, and all tinged with slight anxiety at the thought of such significant changes. Marriage, and now a child too. A roller coaster of strong emotions swept me along like an irresistible tide, I was desperate to tell Mum. I knew how much she wanted a grandchild. But I knew I had to tell James first. I was already anticipating telling him, choosing my time, my words, when I thought the moment exactly right. We had once talked about parenthood, but it wasn't something we'd planned nearly so soon. And I think, in truth, I was keener than him but I very much hoped he'd be as pleased as I was when he finally found out. I was tired, but still excited, as James and I left the hotel that night to return to our fairy-side cottage home. I felt blessed, happy, and content with my life. I had many plans and dreams, some of which were already coming true. Or, that's how it seemed at the time. There weren't very many happy days to come after that. Nothing lasts forever, not in this world, not in this life. I didn't know it then, but the clock was ticking. Tick-tock, tick-tock. I've still got our wedding day photos in a brown velour album. They'll still be at the cottage unless Mum has moved them. I recall the images were taken by a short, fat man with a receding hairline and perfectly round, gold metal-framed glasses who worked part-time for a local paper. My parents had arranged that too. 
I recall thinking the glasses didn't suit the shape of the photographer's plump red face as he arranged us into varying sized groups to take one predictable, unimaginative photo after another. It's strange what sticks in our minds, things that really don't matter at all. I looked at the photos occasionally before my arrest, although not so often as I once did, as the happy images of smiling people, me, James, family and friends, some still with us and others not, tended to make me cry. The past is captured in that album. Twenty celluloid images, all reminders of a happy day before everything changed forever. James always insisted the photos were ours, not to be publicly shared online or anywhere else. He said that applied to all our photos, because they were special and private. There was no other reason. I believed him back then. I didn't have the life experience to question his motives. I only saw good in James, no more and no less. I had no idea that our time together was already running out. I must open the wedding album again sometime soon when I summon the courage, if I'm released. It's been several months since I dared look, now that I think about it. And I should show the photos to my unborn daughter one day in the future, if I ever get the chance. I think she'd appreciate that. Such things can't be avoided forever. The past shaped her life as well as mine. Chapter 5 James woke me surprisingly early on the morning after our wedding, despite the late-night celebrations, not exactly the start to married life I had hoped for or expected. He had an unlikely and infuriating smile on his face as he shook me awake, the ceiling light shining bright above the bed, the electric glare making me wince as I narrowed my eyes almost to slits, screwing up my face. I resisted the impulse to swear loudly and crudely as I turned my head, peering at the alarm clock on the small bedside cabinet to my left. Every part of my body ached, and I'd never felt more exhausted, I think probably due to my pregnancy. Although I'd slept fitfully with those vivid dreams I often experienced, it seemed James, in dramatic contrast, could hardly contain his energy as he skipped across the bedroom floor, throwing open the scarlet curtains, first the left and then the right, almost as if it were a theatrical performance on a West End stage. I was amazed to see how he was already cleanly shaven and dressed in a smart but casual outfit, navy chinos and an olive green needle cord shirt, confusing at best given the hour. I genuinely didn't have the slightest clue what was going on. It was still dark outside, and I could hear the wind howling off Carmarthen Bay, the heavy rain hitting the single glazed bedroom window. I shivered at the sound of the weather. The central heating wouldn't be coming on for another hour. I buried my head in the pillow, pulling the duck down quilt around myself to combat the winter chill. My white wedding dress was hanging on the back of the wardrobe door.